Welcome to Kamalaya's Wellness for Life podcast, where we engage in ongoing, open, and reflective conversations with experts, practitioners, and innovators from around the world on topics of holistic health and well being, with the aim to enrich the time you spend online. I'm your host, Karina Stewart, founder of Kamalaya Wellness Sanctuary. Chief Wellness Officer and Masters in Traditional Chinese Medicine, specializing in women's health, food for healing, and mental and emotional well-being. The Wellness for Life podcast is brought to you by Kamalaya Kosamui in Thailand, an internationally acclaimed, multi-award winning wellness sanctuary nestled amidst granite boulders in an idyllic tropical landscape, encompassing sunrise and sunset ocean views on the southern coastline of the island. Renowned for holistic wellness programs that are results-oriented and promote vibrant health, Kamalaya offers personalized journeys for lifelong wellness. Please subscribe and start tuning in to your true potential. In today's episode, we delve into the fascinating world of sleep science and how it profoundly impacts our lives. Joining us for this insightful conversation is the esteemed Dr. Shane Criado, a renowned expert in functional sleep medicine, integrative psychiatry, and sports psychiatry. Dr. Criado skillfully combines his extensive knowledge to uncover the underlying factors that may be sabotaging patients' sleep quality while providing comprehensive treatment solutions that empower individuals to achieve their goals. Dr. Criado's expertise goes beyond treating the symptoms and examines a holistic understanding of sleep and its intimate connection to overall well being. With a deep passion for helping others optimize their sleep patterns, Dr. Criado is a guiding light for those seeking restorative, and rejuvenative sleep experiences. Get ready to explore the science of sleep with us as we unravel the mysteries behind this essential aspect of our lives. Let's welcome Dr. Shane Criado. Welcome, Shane. It's a pleasure to have you back with us again. Thank you, my dear Karina. It's a pleasure to be back, and I'm so happy to see you thriving and doing so great. We're very grateful. Thank you. Sleep, such an important topic and and with so much depth to it. And though we have had a discussion previously on this, which was very, very, very well received, um, I felt that the need to address this is um, remains very high on people's minds, including my own. <laughs> um, and it seems that despite all the knowledge, we still are struggling with our sleep. Uh, people are still struggling with their sleep, and it has such a big impact. So could you please begin by giving us an overview of how sleep affects our lives, our well-being, and the connections be between sleep and our emotional, mental um, state of being? Absolutely. I, I love the fact that we are exploring this again after over two years, only because we need to remind ourselves about how it impacts every aspect of our lives. Sleep affects every waking hour and every waking hour impacts our sleep. So we can look at it on a holistic overview with the whole body system approach, or we can go down to the nuclei in our cells because sleep affects over 711 genes in our DNA. Oh my gosh. So yeah, when we're not getting proper sleep, and when we say not proper sleep, it means the amount or the duration, the quality of sleep and the timing of sleep. Mm -hmm. Those 711 genes are switched on or off. Around half of those genes that are switched on with poor sleep are ones associated with cancer, heart attacks, mm. strokes, inflammation. And over half those genes that are downregulated or switched off are associated with good immune function, 
reducing inflammation in heart disease and strokes and cancers. And so you have like a double whammy effect that then becomes a catastrophe, a cascade of catastrophe, the longer you go with poor sleep. Mm. So genes are affected, our lifespans are shortened. There was a study that showed new mothers within the first six months of giving birth, their DNA had aged between three and seven years. Mm. Mm. Sleep affects inflammation, immunity, hormone balance, early menopause in women, destroys your testosterone levels and growth hormone levels. So we think about muscle building, fitness. It causes an upregulation of hormones that lead to more fat deposition. Think about unhealthy weight gain, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more stress because it affects the brain directly. In fact, in my work at Amen Clinics with Dr. Daniel Amen, we do SPECT imaging where we look at blood flow and activity levels in different brain regions. And the same patterns we see on our athletes with head injuries, like our boxers and MMA fighters, are the same patterns we see in those with sleep problems. Oh my gosh. It's terrifying when you think about it because it's it's hard to underestimate the severity of sleep on the brain directly. Sleep problems are directly associated with dementia. Mm. Mm. And sleep problems impact the front part of the brain, the sides of the brain, the back of the brain, like a head injury would. But when we look at what those different brain regions do and what problems manifest if they're hurt with sleep problems, it'll make sense to a lot of our listeners today. Mm -hmm. So the front part of our brain helps us with rational thinking and suppressing irrational impulsive thoughts. Mm -hmm. They help us with willpower. Mm-hmm. So avoiding impulsive actions, addictions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They help us with motivation, energy, pleasure, joy, social connectedness, picking up on social cues, mm. but also concentration, uh-huh. sustained attention, how quickly our brain processes information, executive functioning or the ability to apply concepts to real world situations. Many people with sleep problems, therefore, end up with symptoms of depression, a lack of motivation, brain fog, slowed thinking and processing, and even ADHD symptoms because of the frontal lobes being affected. Incredible. Incredible. It is. And this, there's so many other things on the brain that, that sleep problems affect as well, because the sides of the brain are affected, what are known as the temporal lobes. And those are critical for your emotional pendulum regulation. And also, there are main memory centers. Right. New learnings, right? Language, word finding, names and faces, short term memory issues. In fact, it's been quantified by Matthew Walker, as we were discussing earlier about his book, Why We Sleep. And I did mention in my book as well, Peak Sleep Performance, where they did experiments and MRI imaging on two groups of people. I guess it was a bit sadistic. They sleep deprived one group and they allowed another group to get proper sleep. And they found the sleep deprived group, their ability to form new memories dropped by 40%. Oh, my God. So for those listeners right now who are are parents of kids in school or college students or or even high school students, think about a 40% difference in your ability to learn new things or retain the memories that that, that you've made, that you thought you made studying, but then you burn them in night oil both ends and then you sleep deprived yourself, you're not going to be able to reproduce those memories. 40%, that's the difference between getting a 90% or... 50%. 50%. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not even passing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so it goes from the cellular level to your longevity itself. Mm-hmm. That's the power of sleep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting because um, it doesn't take long to start having the negative impact, does it? 
oh, well, if you've been jet lagged, then you know, it doesn't take time at all, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so would you say, you know, I think it seems to me that um, unless you have really immersed yourself in understanding sleep and the impact of sleep and um, the importance of it, it seems that many people, including myself in the past, believed that, yes, sleep was important, but the damage was over a long period of time. You know, the damage was, it took time, it took years to be sleep deprived or not have good sleep or having insomnia for the negative impact on the brain, for example, to take effect. But we now know that's not true. Could you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? Because I think it's important for us to really understand just how critical this is and how quickly the damaging effects begin. I'll quantify it for our listeners. So it may resonate with different groups of listeners here. When I speak about immunity, for example, your ability to fight off infections and viruses like COVID, with one night of getting four hours or less of sleep, the first line of defense against viruses and tumors, they're called natural killer cells. Their functioning drops by 70%, mm. 70. The next day, we found young males in their 20s and 30s getting five hours or less of sleep. Within of six days or so, their, their ability to fight off immune issues, viruses, drop significantly. Their blood sugar levels increase to pre-diabetic levels. Mm -hmm. If you have five hours or less of sleep for several weeks at a time, your testosterone levels can drop to the levels of someone 10 years older than you. Oh my God. And Karina, I, I discovered this the hard way. So a couple of years ago, and I actually have a slide to prove this, uh, I measured my testosterone levels just because I was I was curious. And there were 569, which is not terrible, but not optimal. Right? I want to see it above 700 or 1,000, contrary to what the normal levels are these days, because they reduce what's considered normal every decade, because mm. distortion levels are plummeting all over the world. Mm. And there's many reasons for that, but that's a rabbit hole. So I said, well, maybe I want to get it up. And understandably, I was traveling a lot. I had a lot of work I needed to do, and I was not really focusing on sleep. I was being a bit of a hypocrite. So I decided to tighten things up and focus on my sleep, didn't make any other changes. And then I got my blood work done again around 10 weeks later, because my boss, Dr. Amen, was developing a testosterone boosting supplement. And he asked us docs if we wanted to you know, see what it did for our testosterone levels. And I said, well, I got my testosterone levels done a couple of months ago. Uh, they were on the low normal side. He said, no, I'd like to get another test done because I want to start with the baseline at this point in time. And within 10 weeks, just with the sleep strategies, my levels went from 569 to 827. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. So it's modifiable, yeah, right? It's absolutely. completely modifiable. Absolutely. And not only that, for the young folks, we spoke about memory and concentration mm -hmm. in students and those who want to do well in their jobs. We've also seen that 15% of dementia cases are completely preventable with basic crappy sleep strategies you can print out from Google. And we know that dementia costs the U.S. alone $360 billion a year. A year. Yeah. So 15% of those completely preventable, that's a savings of $55 billion U.S. dollars a year for the U.S. alone. Yes. Yes. And if sleep impacts hypertension, blood pressure, uh, blood sugar levels, diabetes, heart attack, strokes, think about the savings for the world with mm. just personalized Mm. sleep strategies. Mm. And this is not rocket science. We know that it's about synchronizing your your rhythms, your circadian rhythm and your sleep need. And that's completely doable. For those who want to lose weight, we can quantify this further. The hormones are the gatekeepers of the cells. Yeah. And with chronic sleep loss, as in timing or duration or quality, yes, yes. we've seen that 
Four hours of sleep loss or poor quality sleep makes your body hungrier. So the mm. hormone leptin mm. is, is not going to work properly. Leptin is supposed to suppress your appetite. Mm -hmm. And ghrelin, which makes you hungrier, goes up. And for every four hours of sleep you lose, your brain thinks you need 900 more calories to consume. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I didn't know that. I I know that there's a cortisol connection to lack of sleep yes. and weight gain around the belly, the abdominal fat, the visceral fat. A hundred percent. But I was not aware of this impact of uh, appetite. Incredible. Yeah. So leptin, ghrelin, cortisol. So what you consume is converted to fat. In all our bodies, every fat cell converts testosterone to estrogen mm. so then with sleep loss i already mentioned testosterone levels fall so less muscle building more fat building then every fat cell converts the testosterone to estrogen which means more fat building mm. so mm. someone's intent is to lose weight get into a healthy weight range healthy bmi and their sleep is not optimized it's like trying to use a bucket to throw water out of a kayak that has holes in it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's extraordinary. I, I have had that experience myself. We go, won't go into that, but because of the stress of uh, the period of COVID and how Thailand was uh, completely locked uh, without any travelers, and of course that put Kamalaya at risk and so forth, the stress levels were so high and my sleep went out the window and my weight, changed dramatically and it's only as the stress has been uh, uh, reduced better managed etc which took time it took time after the whole <laughs> pandemic episode uh, that that mm -hmm. I can see the difference now I can see the benefits with no other major changes um, just dramatically so it's it's very real I mean these things are not only documented we are living them in our life I'm I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about the connection to um, our moods uh, and sleep, because as you know very well, you work with people uh, clinically. We see it here at Kamalaya. There is an increase in depression and anxiety that is global, and um, and of course during the pandemic, I think people's sleep really did go out the window and hasn't necessarily come back into balance for many people. But could you talk to us about the, that connection, sleep and mood and mental health? A hundred percent. So sleep problems and mental health problems are bi-directional. One influences mm. the other, the other influences the one. Mm. So in the depressive category, since you mentioned that, some type of sleep difficulty occurs in around 90% of those with depression. And most of those tend to be those who sleep long, they have lack of motivation, they lay in bed, and they doze off, then they catch up on sleep during the day or late in the morning, and then they can't fall asleep at night. So it gets completely disrupted. Mm -hmm. They're in a permanent jet lag mode, which kills their motivation further. And then they lie in bed, thinking about how unproductive they are, how they're wasting their days, and it fuels their depression. When I was training as a psychiatrist and in the hospital, I'd have to be in the ER, the emergency room, and evaluate the risk of suicidality to decide whether we could send someone home or put them in the hospital overnight. One of the red flag indicators of a high risk for suicide was recent sleep problems. Mm -hmm direct correlations with suicidality. Why? Because that rational brain isn't going to be working properly. You'll be more impulsive. Mm. And then your emotional pendulum may swing wider than it would because the temporal lobes are not working properly. Right. We see the cortisol rays that you mentioned earlier, and that's tied in with more anxiety. Mm. Now, anxiety is danger mode survival mode and sleeping is the most vulnerable thing we do so if you're in anxiety mode or you have post-traumatic stress disorder you want to avoid the nighttime because maybe you were traumatized at night or maybe you have nightmares then it's going to fragment or disrupt your sleep further 
which will lead to more cortisol, more anxiety, it becomes a vicious cycle. ADHD, we discussed those symptoms associated with poor sleep. A lot of kids are misdiagnosed with ADHD when they may have sleep apnea because of big tonsils or adenoids that are not removed or dealt with. 20% of people with sleep apnea have depressive symptoms or what's called treatment resistance depression where typical antidepressants may not work or be effective. Well, the depression isn't treatment resistant. The doctor is resistant to looking at underlying factors that are fueling the depression. Mm -hmm. Bipolar disorder, one of the first symptoms that tells us someone's going into mania or hypomania is progressively less and less sleep. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. So whether it's bipolar disorder, anxiety, ADHDs, the depressive symptoms and suicidality, there's direct overlaps. And then with medications, benzodiazepines can worsen sleep apnea because they make the muscles more relaxed in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Most of the antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, the SSRIs can worsen restless leg syndrome and cause disruptions to your sleep quality. A lot of the antipsychotic medications can cause weight gain and fuel sleep apnea. So it's very important to not just consider the underlying factors, but also the treatments, because the treatments should not be worse than the issue. Right, right, absolutely. you that really opens a lot of uh, awareness into that uh, whole realm which i think is is uh, so much of a concern now for people you know the sleep but the anxiety as well and the emotional dysregulation that has happened um could you talk to us a little bit about what are some of the things that people need to be addressing um in order to optimize the chances of getting good quality sleep, the right amount of sleep, and also at the right time. Let's let's actually start with what is sleep at the right time? Because, you know, you hear about people having different um, circadian rhythms, some people being morning people, some people being late night people. Is there truth to that? And if so, what is the right time to be getting our sleep? Yes. Yeah, there is truth to that. Some people are morning birds or what we call advanced sleep phase, because we like to sound fancy with big (laughs) words as doctors. (laughs) Then there's a delayed sleep phase, what I like to call the night owls. And then there's people who are more intermediate, pretty much average sleep timings. The research bears out that when you sleep, when you go to sleep between 10 and 11 p.m., those groups of people have the least amount of heart attacks and strokes and stuff like that. So that's generally the healthiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. However, what's even healthier is to stick to what your circadian rhythm is designed to do. If you're a morning bird, if you're a swimmer, you're lucky because swim trainings tend to be early, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a night owl, if you're an NBA player, great, because you'll have night games and you'll be able to go to sleep late and wake up late and be good. However, we can also shift those rhythms. So I do that for my athletes. When we had athletes going to Tokyo a couple of years ago, 16 hour difference between Chicago and Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I have a formula, Mm -hmm. type it out, they follow it, zero jet lag. They can form at their peak when they arrive. It's like a hidden superpower. It's really cool stuff. (laughs) (laughs) So that, that can be really helpful for guests that come to Kamalaya and want to see, synchronize their circadian and their homeostatic drives. Mm-hmm. Don't want to get into the details, but there's calculations I do, a whole a whole system that can help synchronize those rhythms for you. Beautiful. So when it comes to good sleep and sleep timings, the single most important thing to do is to have a fixed wake-up time every mm-hmm. single day. Mm-hmm. 
Now, if some people say, well, I like to go out with my friends once a week on a Friday or a Saturday, and I'm going to come back instead of going to sleep at 11 p.m., I'm going to come back at 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. What do I do? Because my wake-up time is 7 a.m. I would say, wake up at 7 a.m. the next day. Yeah, you're sleep-deprived a couple of hours. So that afternoon, get a two-hour nap. Don't stay in bed until 9 a.m. because you're pushing your brain into another time zone. Mm -hmm. You'll be miserable Mm -hmm. and jet lagged. (laughs) But if you catch up on your sleep in terms of a strategic nap at a certain time, you're not going to have to worry about falling asleep at 11 p.m. the next night because you've not gotten extra sleep. You've only compensated for a total sleep need in a 24-hour period. Mm And I don't even think about hours of sleep anymore. I think about sleep in terms of sleep cycles of 90 minutes each. Mm. So people say, do I need eight hours? No, it depends on your activity levels, your innate sleep needs, your training amounts. Most adults may need seven and a half hours of sleep, which is five sleep cycles of 90 minutes each. Mm -hmm. Some of my elite athletes need 10 and a half. Mm-hmm. or 12 hours of sleep in a 24-hour period because the training is such a high level. Right. So lock in your wake-up time no matter what. Get some sunlight on your face to drive down the melatonin levels. Have some activity, stretching, jumping jacks, Wim Hof breathing, warm water or alkaline water if you'd like. Maybe a cold plunge at Kamalaya <laughs> or a nice sauna uh-huh. just to get your metabolic rate going, yeah. just to get that blood flow going, yeah. right? And if you feel like you need a nap each day, go for it. There's some studies that show people who nap, their risk of heart attacks drops around 37%. And then some studies showed that people who nap, their risk of heart attacks goes up 37% or so. <laughs> and <laughs> And it's confusing to most, but I'll simplify it. I suspect that the people whose risks of heart attacks went up with the naps was not because of the naps. It was because they were probably sleepy during the day because they probably had underlying sleep apnea or other sleep qualitative or sleep disruptive things. Whereas those who took a strategic nap at a fixed time for a fixed duration were in good stead. So if you do that in a proper way, mm-hmm. you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. The goal is to wake up refreshed. It's not normal to wake up unrefreshed. Function well throughout the day and feel sleepy when it's time to get to bed. Mm. And have a nice calming winding down routine before you go to bed because your brain is not a light bulb. It cannot just be switched on or off. But a nice calming routine, dimming the lights. Mm-hmm. Maybe light some candles. Mm -hmm. Maybe have a nice daily download where you journal. Write down your to-do list for the next day or your worry list. Meditate to calm the brain down. So that routine tells your brain, oh, I'm getting ready for bed. This is Mm -hmm. my routine. And make sure that the bedroom is free of distractions like phones and screens and TVs and bright lights and windows. Because your bedroom is supposed to be your cave and your sleep is supposed to be your mini vacation. So caves didn't have flat screen TVs, they didn't have windows, they didn't have bright lights, right? <laughs> That's right. We we owe ourselves that much. You yeah. can have a vacation every day of your life. It's your sleep time. Protect it at all costs. Yeah. yeah. Many people that I come across, and I'm sure you must find the same, really do struggle with their sleep. And in your experience, what are some of the things that are common um, contributing factors to not getting the optimum amount of sleep, quality of sleep uh, for people? Things we might not even realize that we're doing, but that are having an impact in our sleep. There are tons of things that impact our sleep, Mm -hmm. right? So... Just at the some of the things we discussed already. So people want to just get into bed and then try and sleep, or they're doing something activating on the screen or something busy, 
until it's time for bed. A lot of medications that people are on can disrupt their sleep. They have variable times of waking up or they sleep in on the weekends, what is called social jet lag. So just having those routines is critical. We saw routines fell off with lockdowns and COVID. Absolutely. Anxiety is a big, big factor because anxiety is danger mode and sleeping is vulnerable. You're not going to be able to sleep if you have anxiety. Alcohol devastates your ability to get good quality sleep. People say, well, it helps me fall asleep. Yeah, but you wake up in the middle of the night because it's going to bounce off your brain cells and your brain cells go through a mild alcohol withdrawal. You're going to wake up. Isn't it also true dehydration? That, oh, mm-hmm. so excuse me. Sorry for interrupting, but just with alcohol, it really helped me to understand that it's a sedative. That's not the same as helping your brain rest and sleep. To sedate is not the same, and that that seemed to somehow it it impacted me. I'm not a big drinker anyway, so it's not a big part of my life. But it helped me understand why. Yes, if I have a glass of wine, I feel relaxed. I fall asleep easily, but I don't get quality sleep and I feel that I wake up too early and uh, when I'm having slept enough and way be earlier than I would normally wake up and I don't feel refreshed. And so the fact that it is a sedative uh, seemed to help me in, in my understanding. Is that is that part of the impact is that it's sedating? 100%. Than, yeah, yeah. Yes. So it'll help you fall asleep, stop it, help you stay asleep. And it doesn't improve your sleep quality. Right. And why do I care about quality? I keep harping upon quality. It's because we want to make sure you get enough deep sleep or non-REM sleep and enough dream sleep. Mm. So deep sleep, why do we care about that? The single most important factor with deep sleep, apart from growth hormone release that happens in deep sleep, is that drainage channels open up to flush out toxins that build up in the brain during the day. They're called the glymphatic system. They are only open in deep sleep. So if you're not getting deep sleep, they're not going to open direct risk for dementia. Right. And if you don't get dream sleep, which consolidates your memory, you can have fragmented memories and fragmented sleep. Mm. So you may get nine hours of sleep if you've had a couple of drinks, but it's not going to be quality sleep at all. Right. Beautiful. And sleep apnea is also going to worsen with alcohol intake. So alcohol relaxes the muscles, sleep apnea will be worse. It will further fragment your sleep, further reduce your deep sleep, and it's going to be a vicious cycle. Right. Right. And you were uh, about to also start talking about dehydration. Mm, Yes. So dehydration is a big factor. Not many people think that they're dehydrated or even care about this. But if you have less than ideal amounts of fluid in your system, you are going to have more stress hormone release, cortisol release, and that's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. Cortisol typically peaks around four to six in the morning. But if you're dehydrated or you've had a very early dinner, like at five or six p.m., and then you're going to sleep at 11 p.m., your blood sugar levels may fall to lower levels, and then your body will say, oh, we need to get more blood sugar levels up. So where do we get them from? We get them from the muscles, from the glycogen stores. What do we need to pull the glycogen out? Cortisol. Mm -hmm. It's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Dehydration is a big factor. Not many people know that vitamin D, D for dog, is critical for sleep regulation, and iron is too. Mm So it's magnesium for deep sleep. So it's important to get those blood levels checked to make sure they're in good amounts. And vitamin D levels in normal ranges are 30 to 100. For sleep, I want to see them above 60, above 70. Mm -hmm. Even if it's in normal ranges, it's not going to be good enough for your sleep. Wonderful. Many people don't know that temperature of the room needs to be 66 or 69 Fahrenheit or 18 to 20, 21. And many people wake up in the middle of the night feeling hot. Why? Because in the later half of the night, you have more dream sleep. And in dream sleep, your heart rate goes up. You're burning as many calories as you are doing when you're awake. It's going to wake you up. So I advise my folks to have many thin layers of sheets or light blankets. When you wake up in the middle of the night, just pull those off and go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I think that that's a big one, the temperature 
uh, the right temperature for the deep sleep. So thank you for that. I live in the tropics and, uh, you know, it's a tricky balance between, you know, using the air conditioners too much and at the same time, not not cooling down enough, not the room not being chilled enough to have that good quality sleep. It took me a long time to figure that one out. Uh, very Thank good. You. <laughs> um, you mentioned sleep apnea, and there are other sleep disorders like restless leg syndrome, which you also mentioned, insomnia, sleep apnea, um, and they can have you know a really big impact on the quality of our sleep. Can you speak to some of the things that could be helpful in attenuating these? And when I'm speaking about insomnia, that's very different than, you know, not getting enough sleep or, or um, you know, the lighter issues around sleep, like it's a more chronic, more um, uh, persistent issue. Absolutely. So many sleep disorders, some of the most common ones are insomnia, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome. Right. So restless leg syndrome, it is basically a sensation of uneasiness, of feeling like you need to move your legs. That typically occurs at night or when you've been in one position for a very long time, like flights. Mm -hmm. That makes you feel like you need to move the leg and moving the leg can relieve some of that weird deep sensation. So it's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need to do a sleep study to say you have restless leg syndrome. But then what do you do about it? One of the most important factors associated with restless leg syndrome is low storage forms of iron, which is called ferritin. Get a ferritin level done, and if those levels are low, load up on iron. That's going to be one of the, the most important factors that can help you with restless leg syndrome. Another big one is all of the SSRI medications and SNRI medications in psychiatry are associated with restless leg syndrome. So if you're having a nighttime dose of that medication, switch it in the morning. If you are on that medication in the morning and it's still affecting your restless legs, you might want to talk to your doctor about adjusting the dose. Mm -hmm. Another big one is ability to stretch your legs and maybe do some yoga, gentle movements before bed, that could be helpful. Magnesium and rhodiola in the right doses have been found to be helpful for restless legs. There are certain medications as well. Sleep apnea can worsen restless leg syndrome. So if you have that, and we'll just dive into that in a moment, that needs to be ruled out as well. So those are the core aspects of understanding restless leg syndrome and treating it. Most issues recover pretty nicely if you've accounted for the underlying contributing factors. And if it's more serious, despite mitigating those factors, see a sleep doc and we'll figure it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding sleep apnea, so it simply means stopping breathing while you are asleep. And how many times you should stop breathing? Well, mild sleep apnea is if you stop breathing between five and 15 times per hour, where each pause in breathing is longer than 10 seconds duration. Moderate sleep apnea is stopping breathing 15 to 30 times per hour, with those pauses being over 10 seconds each. And severe sleep apnea is stopping breathing more than 30 times per hour. What? Now, why is this bad? Because your brain is essentially suffocating and it damages the brain the same way concussions do. So all the things we discussed earlier, the downstream effects, the cascade of catastrophe, like I like to mm -hmm. <laughs> say, whether it's heart attacks, strokes, dementias, cancer risks, sudden death, weight gain, obesity, hormone balance, immunity, inflammation, all directly related to sleep apnea. Mm. Now we can go even further and say, well, sleep problems are directly related to the top causes of death in the world. Sleep is a modifiable and direct risk factor for, as we know, the some of the causes of death are heart disease, obesity, diabetes, COPD or lung infections and damage, but also, also drowsy driving. So in the US, around 6,400 cases of deaths 
in car accidents are related to drowsy driving. Mm. So if we reduce the burden of sleep apnea, lives will be saved. You'll have longer periods of productivity and you're going to drop dementia, cancer rates and the costs to quality of life and to the economy that are inherent with that. Mm -hmm. What would you guess um, is the average in the United States, uh, the number of hours that people are getting of sleep? What would, if you, I don't know if there's the data on that, but I'm curious. Yes, so there is data. Prior to the COVID crisis, around one third of Americans, or around over 100 million Americans had sleep problems. And ever since COVID, with People working from home, losing their jobs, more anxiety, more mental health issues, more medications, which destroy people's sleep. It's estimated that over 60% of Americans now have serious sleep issues. Oh so we had the mental health tsunami. Sorry for use of the word. I know in that region, it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. You then have the sleep problems that have been exacerbating everything and now we're expecting healthcare costs to rise dramatically with all the downstream effects of this chronic sleep deprivation that the u.s and the rest of the world are facing unbelievable yeah these tidal waves uh of of, of issues this I, I, I see this at kamalaya for the sleep i mean it just it's it's a big issue it's a really 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 big issue and therein lies an opportunity exactly well speaking of opportunity um with sleep apnea before we do move, move uh, uh, on to the next uh, thing that's catching my attention right now. But the, with the sleep apnea, what are your recommendations? Because um, all I really know of is the uh, CPAP, is it called? The breathing mm -hmm. apparatus that is very, very helpful and very advanced compared to previous models. They can be smaller, they're more quiet. Mm, yes. So the first thing to remember is the biggest risk factor for sleep apnea is being overweight. Mm. obesity mm. Mm. because sleep apnea the most common type of sleep apnea is where the airway collapses the tongue falls back so if you have a thicker neck mm. it's going to be a narrow airway mm -hmm. it's going to cause less oxygen to go in your airway is going to close up periodically sleep apnea mm. so losing weight is the single biggest important thing you could do if you're overweight or obese now we think about sleep apnea being most common in those who are elderly because you have looser muscles, floppier airways, those who drink alcohol. So minimizing the alcohol use, weight loss, and of course you can't reverse aging. Well, maybe with sleep, your telomere length actually increases so your DNA re can reduce this aging or reverse it to some degree, right? <laughs> yes. But sleeping in your side goes a long way because in your side, you have more cartilage in your airway. Mm -hmm and your tongue doesn't fall back to obstruct it. So sleeping on your side is a good strategy. Even raising the head of the bed, maybe 15 to 20 degrees, is a good, helpful strategy. And if you do need CPAP, it's a very effective strategy. It's basically a machine that pumps air under pressure to a tube and a mask so that the air keeps the airway open. It can be silent. The machines are much more advanced than they were previously. But there's other options besides CPAP machines as well, mm -hmm. such as a dental device where mm -hmm. a sleep dentist can help look at your jaw and have you fitted with a device that allows the jaw to kind of be forward, maybe one or two millimeters or so. And that'll stretch the airway a little bit so that the tongue doesn't fall back and collapse, it can reduce the severity of the sleep apnea, especially those who have mild or moderate sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And another invention that's been more recent is a device called Inspire here in the US. 
It's basically a stimulating device, how you have a pacemaker for the heart, but it's a pacemaker for the tongue muscle. So when you're sleeping, it stimulates the tongue muscle so that the tongue doesn't fall back inside your mouth and block the airway. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cause much pain. It's not going to be weird. It just prevents the tongue from falling back. Mm -hmm. However, you have to meet very narrow criteria for this to be accepted. You have to fail CPAP, you have to fail the dental device. You have to look at whether the airway is collapsing the right way. But what if you have a deviated septum, nasal septum? Maybe treating that is going to go a long way in treating your sleep apnea. For kids, the adenoids and the tonsils are the first thing I would look for. There's many options available and even more on the horizon. A couple of medications are in phase three trials right now to help reduce the severity. And now in the obesity world, their latest fad and I'm a big fan of these medications thus far are the GLP-1 agonist medications. Mm -hmm. They are different names in different countries. They help you lose weight dramatically, but also healthily. And so that's going to reduce the severity of sleep apnea. Maybe you won't need to use that machine, Mm -hmm. or you might need lower pressures in the machine, which will be much more tolerable Mm -hmm. when you're sleeping at night. Mm -hmm. So if anyone says, oh, you have sleep apnea, that means you need a CPAP, and they're not looking at the nuances that I've discussed with you, then they're doing a bad job and see someone else. Right, right. Uh, Clearly, as you were explaining that, all the underlying mechanisms um, and all the things that can be done that could improve it before you have to actually um, make the decision about the CPAP, including the dental fitting. That sounds really interesting. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I would like to ask you, if you were to say in an ideal world, what would be that sleep routine for the average person, not necessarily for that peak performance athlete, Uh, But for the average person, given the average type of uh, work schedule, life schedule that you see, you know, clinically, um, what time would people start preparing for bed? What, you know, how much before sleep should people get off their screens based on data, based on science? Um, Is there an optimum, uh, you know, you said mentioned seven and a half hours, uh, I'm wondering if there are people who actually really do need more, not just athletes. Um, just a kind of optimum scenario that people could have in their mind as a little bit of a map to aim for, because there's so many moving parts that it's really, really difficult to pull it all together, in my opinion. And I'm someone who's in the health field. I feel like it's a basket of kittens with regard to sleep. You know, there's a caffeine issue as well. You know, do we eat how many hours before sleep should be we eat? be eating. Some people feel they need to snack right before bed or it wakes them up. Others feel like, no, early dinner and then don't eat because then you sleep better. It's it's a, Sometimes it's a little bit confusing what that ideal optimum preparation for sleep might be. You touched on some issues already, but I'm, now I'd like, like the whole picture. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're right. One size does not fit all. No. And how does someone know how much sleep they need? So let's assume they've said, okay, after listening to us today, and I'm going to have fixed sleep timings every day. Great. And assuming you don't have sleep apnea or any other qualitative sleep issues, I would say if you've gone to Kamalaya and you've had good sleep and you've woken up feeling refreshed and functioning throughout the day, Say you got seven and a half hours of sleep, then that's your optimum amount of sleep. Some people, as you rightly said, need more sleep anyway. So teenagers need nine to ten and a half hours of sleep, and they're getting much less than we do. Then other people just naturally need nine hours or ten and a half hours of sleep. It's just the way they're built. One percent of the population are short sleepers they need six hours or less and they still function optimally yeah it's their genetics so so there is variety assuming there is variety so i'd say if you've been on vacation or at the amazing kamalaya resort and you say well i was feeling really good and refreshed and getting this amount of sleep then that's the amount of sleep that's right for you okay 
but what routines will you establish to lock in that sleep, that nice border wall between sleep and wakefulness that's so important? Well, fixed wake-up time. So let's say for me, I know seven and a half hours of sleep is, is ideal. Now, if you have work and you have to wake up at six in the morning, then that's the time you have to wake up at. You can't quit your job or go to work late and your boss will hate you forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> and maybe you can get up at 7.30. So I need to wake up at 6.30 in the morning. I need a good hour in order to be ready for clinic. So if my wake up time is 6.30, which it is, and I need seven and a half hours of sleep, that means 11 p.m. is when I'm supposed to be asleep which means 10 p.m. I start a nice, calming, winding down routine. Okay. Make sense? Yep, yep. A good right. hour. So, you give yourself the... Yes. Yeah. A good hour. So some people say, don't use screens three hours before bedtime. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. You can dim the lights. <laughs> start that nice, calming, winding down routine that I discussed from 10 p.m. onwards. No stressful talks with the wife or the hubby. Just something calming and relaxing. Save it for the next day. No bright screens, no exciting stuff in your phone, calming, nice routines, meditation, non-sleep, deep rest strategies, yoga, nidra, physiological sighing. Then around 11 p.m., get into bed. You'll sleep. Alarm wakes you up. No snoozing <laughs> on the alarm. <laughs> Wake up at 6.30 like I do. Get some sunlight on your face. Mm -hmm. And if you... Well, in the wintertime in Chicago, it's not going to be bright and sunny at 6.30. So I have these blue light delivering glasses, the AO glasses. I love those ones because I don't have any financial connection with them at all. But they're really cool because they look snazzy. They deliver blue light. It doesn't hurt the eyes. And they've quantified the amount of light you get so that it stimulates your brain enough to suppress its melatonin. So you're going to feel more fresh and alert. So you can use this even when crossing time zones with my jet lag protocols, very effective. Beautiful. And then when you wake up, get some stretching, do some activity, some deep breathing, and you're good to go. If you feel, for example, in my work with psychiatry, integrative psychiatry, it can be really draining for me. So if you feel like you need a nap in the middle of the day, have a fixed time for it, Yeah, 20 to 30 minutes, and a nice weighted blackout eye mask, some earplugs, and do some breathing or non-sleep deep rest strategies. Set the alarm. If you get sleep, great, you wake up. If you don't get sleep, still great because you've calmed the brain down. As the Dalai Lama said, sleep is the best meditation. Mm -hmm. So we know that even calming the brain down and meditating, even if you don't fall asleep, is still recharging your brain. Mm -hmm. A NASA study showed this, that when their pilots got a 26-minute nap, their alertness and productivity improved by 30 and 50%. Mm -hmm. So you can get so much more done in the remaining afternoon hours than you would otherwise. Yeah. Meals before sleep. How much before sleep should we have stopped eating or that's a big one. That is a big one. And I would throw it right back to you and say, well, what kind of meal is one consuming, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but, but so many cultures, you know, I, I think of Spain, for example, they, they eat dinner very, very late. And then Mexico, they do eat dinner at 8 p.m., but it's very light. It's a bowl of soup and a piece of bread. I mean, it's a very small dinner. The big meals are breakfast and lunch. But then there are, you know, Europeans, let's say other Europeans, where it's a pretty hefty meal at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So you're not finishing till 9. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just, yes. there seems to be a lot of variety. The Chinese uh, culture, the Asian culture, t tends to have early, early dinners. Also the Japanese, very early. Mm. Very full dinners, yes. but so, very early. So, yeah. Absolutely. I would say the first thing to remember is sleep hygiene protocol. So you shouldn't eat three hours before your desired bedtime. Right. Not necessarily. Okay. Because as I said, if you're eating way early and then your blood sugar levels drop in the middle of the night, you're going to wake up. Right. So my rule of thumb is consume foods that contain magnesium, melatonin, the stuff that calms the brain down. Mm -hmm. Consume foods that 
don't have c- fast carbs right or high in fat although the keto diet is great but for your nighttime meal stick to something that has high protein think about kombucha for the gut microbiota so that you have good gut health which synchronizes with sleep mm-hmm. high protein and slow carbs like baby carrots sweet potato great but if you're having fast carbs like sugar rice bread a lot of it it's going to be metabolized pretty quickly broken down and then you have a sugar peak and then a crash which is going to wake you up right mm-hmm. so sticking to a good meal around 2 hours before desired bedtime protein slow carbs good hydration mm-hmm. you're going to be good okay that's helpful i think that's very very helpful cuz some people recommend a lot of starches at night uh because it seems on some level they can be um calming uh i can't i can't remember the exact link to why they would be calming but anyway i appreciate this and it makes a lot of sense also because it won't spike your blood sugar level and therefore you won't have that crash wonderful i i feel really inspired i can't wait to put some of this into practice tonight since i woke up at three in the morning <laughs> this morning <laughs> i think that's because you may have a very busy brain yeah. and so yeah. what's so cool about dream sleep is that is controlled by centers in the temporal lobes called the hippocampi the hippocampus and that's the same area that controls working memory active things you're doing uh, they've looked at rats as well rats running around a maze during the day in their dreams the same areas are active uh, and so if you're a busy brain lady and a high functioning lady like you are a slight thought is going to wake you up Yeah, you're exactly that's exactly right. I I I have a and I'm grateful for it, you know, to have my full mental um faculties alive and well. I did have a, a really long recovery from uh COVID which definitely affected at the time my memory, my mental clarity and oh my gosh, I felt such a loss because those are things that my whole life have been a big part of who I am. I like to be mentally engaged and stimulated. And so and it is true that's often what will wake me up is a thought and it's not a panic thought, it's not an anxiety thought, it's a thought but it gains enough energy that it pops me right out of sleep. I did find um I I think I listened um to Andrew Huberman um and mentioning that magnesium 3 and 8 had a good effect in calming the brain and that has helped a lot for me for my kind of active <laughs> brain activity. Oh yeah. Magnesium promotes deep sleep and non-REM sleep. I'm a big fan of magnesium, uh-huh. especially for those light sleepers that are listening to us today. Yes. A weighted blanket or a weighted cooling blanket is effective. Ah, so you might be a very light sleeper in general and so little sounds and movements in the bed or light coming through a window is going to affect your sleep. Yes. That's why blackout blinds or a weighted eye mask, weighted eye mask cool the muscles around mm. the eyes. Mm. Your plugs don't have any pets or snoring partners and on the same bed avoid that. And of course the right temperature because if you're sensitive to one thing you're sensitive to other things like temperature too. And top of that I like ashwagandha in the right doses. amazing for suppressing the cortisol peak in the middle of the night mm. so magnesium ashwagandha i like 5 htp because it helps make more serotonin to mm. calm the busy brain down mm. for those who have obsessive kinds of thinking or worrying thoughts before bedtime b6 and 5 htp are really good because they help make more serotonin so there are certain Beautiful. supplements based on your need that you can take to kind of consolidate your sleep. And Dr. Amen had asked me to build a sleep supplement for him a couple of years ago which I did. And we called it put me to sleep where it has the magnesium, it has mm. the B6, it has the 5-HTP, it has very low dose melatonin only because melatonin is supposed to nudge your brain into sleep and it's just not supposed to knock you out and has GABA to calm the brain. So it actually promotes deep sleep and dream sleep. Mm. Mm-hmm. So if you source the right doses of supplements and you take it 60 to 90 minutes before your desired bedtime it's going to help strengthen 
the quality Beautiful. of your sleep cycles. Beautiful. And Put Me to Sleep is the name of, of the one you developed. Yes, I love that. That's right. I love that. Thank That's you. Beautiful. Um, yes, I'm a big fan in supplementation if it'll keep people off sleeping pills. It's not to replace all the sleep hygiene and all the other things that you have been discussing, which are so important. I also think you nailed my sleep type. I'm a light sleeper. I do so uh -huh. well when I can block out noises. So I sometimes will even sleep with noise reduction, like on airplanes, that really works for me to have those uh, noise reduction um, headsets and also sometimes even at home so that I really have that absolute sensory deprivation experience. And I love, I tell you, one of my like a security blanket when I travel are my eye shades. I have I have <laughs> foam ones that don't press the eye. So your eyeball is nice. free, but there's uh, a, a sense of comfort around the eyes. And between that and the noise reduction, I'm good to go. I could stay on a plane forever with those two. But if you take <laughs> one of those away, I'm in trouble. They really do help um, improve the quality and the length of my sleep. I think I'm, I'm in that light sleeper category and, and busy mind. I would also say for those light sleepers that you might want to look at EMF blocking ah, devices uh -huh. and also grounding mats. Now, if you're in Kamala, you put your toes in the sand. It's a beautiful thing. It's a blessing, right? Yes, yes. But if you're living in a condo in Chicago like I am, yes. right below my feet right now, I have a grounding mat I'm placing my feet on. Because mm. grounding helps you synchronize your self to towards magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So grounding, EMF blocking are really helpful for those light sleepers mm -hmm. as well. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Or a walk on the grass or the earth or the sand mm. on a regular basis. So daily on some yes. level. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I think that will I think we we need these things. We don't realize some of us are more sensitive to these things than others, but they are affecting us. Whether we're sensitive to them or not. And it's I, there's nothing that makes me my mood um, shine the way a good night's sleep does. You know, when you wake <laughs> up in the morning, literally with a <laughs> smile and a twinkle oh. in your eye and everybody says, what's going on? You look amazing. And you do. You feel amazing as well. Is there anything we haven't covered, um, Dr. Shane, that you would like to cover now before we come to a close? There is so much to talk about, right? <laughs> you can go on for days and days. But I would I would like to just let everyone know, everyone who's listening today, that the reason we did this is because you know, Karina, how crucial a personalized sleep approach is. It's foundational for your brain health, for your health. And I know I spewed out all these statistics about heart attacks and strokes and dementias and cancers, but there is help only because sleep is a modifiable risk factor. And just as you may go to a tailor to get accurate fittings or a personal trainer to get a training program that's uniquely for you or a nutritionist to have a meal plan catering to your unique metabolic profile, the way your genes work, you need a personalized plan for sleep Absolutely. optimization. And that goes hand in hand with what we're doing, what we may do together down yes. the line. Yes. And it goes along with the personalized supplement approach as well. So I also design supplements for companies and a personalized approach is the only way forward. This isn't hard to do. Yeah. If someone asked me to fix an airplane engine, I wouldn't know what in the world to do. So you don't need to figure it out yourself. All right. Beautiful. Well, for people who do want to read your book, can you give us a title again, please, of your book? Yes, it's called Peak Sleep Performance for yes. Athletes, and it's on Amazon and Kindle all over the world. Wonderful. And it's not just for athletes. It's just the information and the strategies I use with my Olympic athletes for anyone to address immediately. The separate chapters for supplements, for nutrition, for the bedroom, how to choose the right pillows and mattresses, anxiety calming strategies, there's strategies for jet lag and travel. So I think that's a really, really good option for people who want to start their mission of personalized sleep yeah. right away. And if people want to reach me, my website is shanecriado.com, my Instagram, where I post a lot of videos and a whole series of videos on debunking the commonly held misconceptions about sleep. It's called, my Instagram is called Peak Sleep Performance. And I'd be happy to be in touch with anyone who 
wants to start their journey of sleep optimization together. I think that's wonderful. And and thank you for highlighting that, that we don't have to do this alone. It, 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 it may sound really easy to solve, but I am someone that has really, really had to um, work at it since my 40s. So some, some time ago, um, when I lost uh, my sleep due to too much stress, and uh, and 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 once it goes off, it's something we take for granted when we have great sleep. But once it goes off kilter, it is not as easy as I thought. And I'm in in the health field to bring it back into balance. So I highly recommend that people uh, reach out to you, read your book, reach out to you at the minimum, follow you on Instagram, and 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 um, reach out for help um, because the impact of poor sleep is just too great to have to go through life that way. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shane. It was a pleasure thank last you. time we did this, but I have to say, I think I learned even more this time. And I, I love what you're doing and I love your approach um, to what you're doing. Maybe on another time we can talk about the integrative psychiatry, another one of my passions. Yes. Yeah. Anytime you need me, I'd be happy to be back. Thank you, Karina. It's such a pleasure seeing you and speaking with you and to your audience. I'm there for you anytime. Thank you. And we will be collaborating on something for those of you listening in who know Kamalaya. Uh, we have some exciting plans for how we're going to be collaborating together. So stay tuned. Thank you so much again, Dr. Shane. Thank you. To delve deeper into Dr. Shane Criado's work and explore his expertise, please visit his website at www.shanecriado.com. For those seeking an immersive wellness retreat to enhance their sleep, Kamalaya offers the Sleep Enhancement Wellness Program. It is expertly designed to create the optimal mental and physical conditions to support a replenishing sleep. Discover more about this transformative program at www.kamalaya.com. We are deeply grateful for your ongoing listenership and for sharing our podcast with your loved ones. Your positive feedback and support truly warm our hearts. We remain committed to covering the most relevant and important topics for our listeners and aim to share vital knowledge with a broader global audience. We value your input and would love to hear from you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions or feedback on the topics we have covered. Simply email us at info at kamalaya.com with the subject line, Wellness for Life podcast. As we wrap this episode up, we hope you found it both insightful and intriguing. May you have sweet dreams and enjoy the deep, restful sleep you deserve. Until next time, take care and be well.